Welcome back to Toast. Today we are exploring the inner workings of myself. I'm joking. We're just still talking about the country of Jordan and all of its beauty. So uh, last uh, episode, I was just kind of talking about, you know, getting to Petra, the beauty of Petra, Wadi Rum, all of these beautiful things that everybody loves to go to and to explore. Those are kind of like the main things to see in Jordan. Now, today I'm going to talk about personally my favorite experience in Jordan, which was a place called Wadi Mujib. So first of all, how did I get there? I mean, you know, I kind of finished my day in Petra. I go sleep in this empty hostel and it's supposed to be packed. I'm alone with the owner again. And then I decide, you know, screw it. I'm going to hitchhike, but I'm going to do it real hitchhiking this time because, you know, from Wadi Rum, it was kind of cheating or whatever. So I get, I hit the road and at like seven in the morning, I'm sitting there. And this is like kind of the nice thing because a lot of my hitchhiking stories have just like really, really good luck. And often I, you know, choose the countries quite wisely. Like you don't hitchhike in every country. You hitchhike in countries where you know they have some sort of hitchhiking culture or some so like common, you know, knowledge of what hitchhiking is, at least so that they're not looking at you like, what is this guy doing? Why is his thumb out? And like, I'm not going to stop for him. Right. Um, and essentially, Jordan's not necessarily one of those countries. So I was just going to try it. I figured it was worth a shot. I wasn't going that far. I think I had something like two or three hundred kilometers to do. So it wasn't too crazy, uh, especially with the amount of time that I had. I was ready to kind of sleep outside if necessary. I bought enough food and things like that. So no matter what, if I was stranded, I was ready. And I suggest you do that if you are hitchhiking. It's better to be prepared and not need what you prepared than to be unprepared and need things that you don't have. So I carry extra water, extra food, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, eventually I kind of get picked up, you know, I get edging for like further and further. Um, I was waiting really like hour and a half maybe between rides, but these rides were kind of taking me further. So as much as I wasted a day, um, you know, as the old saying goes, the more time you have, the less money you need. This is kind of the secret of long term traveling, because when you're going on your two week vacation, you're going to spend maybe three thousand dollars because you, you have to pay your flight. And now your flight is divided between those two week days. So, you know, your kind of budget keeps going up and up. When you have more time, you don't really need so much money. You can do the hitchhiking, you could do the couch surfing, you could, you know, sacrifice a meal because you don't have just 14 meals, you have, you know, 500. So you can eat like, you know, hummus and bread, and it's not going to kill you. Um, and plus, the hummus was really, really good. I mean, you are in Jordan at the, at the moment. So, Essentially, you know, I'm, I'm hitchhiking, I'm hitchhiking, I'm really trying to get to this place called Wadi Mujib. And I treated this the exact same way as I treat most of my traveling based on recommendations. Somebody told me you have to go to this place. So I said, okay, I'm going to go. I didn't Google it. I don't know what it is. I have no idea what to expect. All I knew is that that was my destination. And so um, eventually... I couldn't get a hitch because I was kind of in, in the city where they left me off. So I took like a, a one dinar bus and it brought me all the way to the coast of the magnificent Dead Sea. Yes, the Dead Sea is also in Jordan. It's not just in Israel. As much as I wanted to go see it in Israel, the borders in Israel were closed all year. They, I believe, still are closed to tourism. It's only Israelis or uh, birthright trips that are allowed inside and who knows what the regulations are by the time this comes out. So um, I go to the dead, uh, you know, I take the bus to get to the Dead Sea and I'm starting to hitchhike from the Dead Sea because that's where Wadi Mujib is. It's all along the Dead Sea. I still don't know what it is, but I know that Wadi means kind of canyon, right? That little Wadi Rum, uh, Wadi whatever it was for Petra. So like, I kind of have an idea that this is a canyon and I am hitchhiking along the Dead Sea and this is kind of where you you know, start seeing more of the impact of the country that's across the Dead Sea, which is Israel or Palestine or Philistine. And so, you know, somebody who picks me up ends up being this, you know, um, guy from Palestine. And he's, you know, telling me, and actually, I understand um, Palestinian Arabic a lot more than Jordanian. It's a little bit more similar because uh, to Egyptian. So it was a little bit easier to speak to him. And I had a lot better of a conversation. It's very eye-opening to speak to somebody who's been displaced from their house and yet here they are picking up a random foreigner helping them and he's not trying to preach you know it's his country or whatever he just wants this family to live in safety and yet they're constantly under um 
dan- in like threat and danger. And, you know, this is a complicated debate. Who's the aggressor? Who's whatever? We're not going to open it today. But I get picked up by a Palestinian man and he brings me all the way to Wadi Mujib. And at this moment, that is where I like completely lost my mind. I had no idea that this was a canyon that was filled with water. So we get to this place called Wadi Mujib um, that's on the edge of the Dead Sea. And it's actually like a river that's been carving this canyon for who knows how long. And it has these same formations of kind of like, um, you know, canyon maybe that you would expect in the Grand Canyon or places in Colorado, the, um, the uh, what are they called? The Shallows or something like that in the States, the very famous places. And here they have this kind of adventure excursion. So I think you pay like 20 bucks and you get to walk up the river. So you get into this canyon, you know, you you need to get rid of all of your phone and all of these things. So even if I did have, you know, if I was showing you guys pictures, I wouldn't have any pictures of this because, well, you just can't bring it because you are going to be deep into this river. There are moments where you're swimming, you're hanging onto cords. You are literally walking up waterfalls against the current, just pulling on these cords. Wadi Mujib was absolutely spectacular because not only are you deep into the desert, so you haven't seen any water aside from the Dead Sea, which is, you know, barely water. It's like this gelatinous fluid, kind of like the salt pools in in Siwa in, in Egypt. And so, you know, you're kind of looking at this like very hostile environment and suddenly you have fresh running water. Technically, you could drink it. I wasn't doing that and I'm not taking the chances. But, um, and, and, you know, you're climbing up this and there's birds and there's there's life, you know, there's there's insects, there's fish that are chewing at you, just ripping off the dead skin from your, you know, shins or whatever it was. And there are trees inside the canyon. It was an absolute like shock to the senses especially at that point i'd spent five months in the desert i hadn't really seen any trees um aside from like saint catherine in egypt and so i was completely shocked and completely blown away not just to the sight of this beautiful canyon it's just you know different colored rock formations all kind of bent and 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 carved over thousands of years by this uh, river but also from the fact that you have greenery and wildlife um you know, I do this whole thing. I meet some people there. We took actually some pictures that they ended up sending me um, because they had like waterproof cases or whatever. Um, and, you know, you really just go up this river and then back down. And then it's a little bit easier when you're coming down. Uh, but you need to watch your head because there are waterfalls and these are dangerous. But this was my favorite place in all of Jordan. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, it's not really on the map of like tourist destinations. I don't know why. I guess other people kind of go to like the baptism place of Jesus Christ. So more people kind of go there, even though it's like 20 minutes away from the baptism spot. Nobody really goes to Wadi Mujib. So check it out. Um, What ends up happening is when I'm leaving Wadi Mujib, you know, I'm at the Dead Sea. I spent most of my day kind of hitchhiking, a lot of wasted time. And I I, I just decide, okay, well, screw it. I'm going to go to the Dead Sea. I'm going to hang out over there. And maybe I'll just like sleep by the sea. Like, you know, there shouldn't be any insects or anything. So I could pretty much sleep without a, even a tent just outside, maybe in my sleeping bag if it gets a little bit cold. But it's June, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, I get to the Dead Sea and then um, naturally, you know, people are doing the things that they do when they're at the Dead Sea, which is digging the mud. Dig that crazy um, mud out and just cover yourself, make yourself completely like black with this thing that just, you know, once you finally wash it off, so you know, you do your face, your whole body if you want, and when you wash it off, you have the softest skin in the world. But you need to kind of be a little bit careful when you're putting it because they have these grains of salt, which can literally cut you. I mean, it's, it'll be a clean cut because you're cutting it with salt, so don't worry. But you know, you still don't want cuts necessarily. So um, you kind of need to be careful. And I'm, you know, putting the salt on uh, or not the salt, but the mud. And some people are actually like filling these containers, like four liter bottles. And so they're going to bring it and maybe process it and make it into something to sell either in Jordan or export, or maybe they just use it for themselves, their family, who knows? There's a lot of it, right? It's it's an entire sea surrounded by it. And, uh, you know, below the water is all that as well. Um, the cool thing about the Dead Sea is also these like formations that you have. You know, you have a lot of dead things around it because it's it's so hostile. I mean, like birds and nothing can kind of feed. There's no fish or anything in there. There's all petrified wood around and you kind of have these layers 
of different colors, like these oranges, yellows, and blues, kind of like like steps inside. And, and when you step on it, like the salt just kind of disintegrates. So like it looks like it's a solid thing that you're stepping on or that you're, but when it's in the water, it's actually quite soft and um, very interesting moment. And so um, I decided, you know, I was going to ask these guys, hey, where are you going? And so I start speaking to them and sure enough, they don't really speak English. I'm, do, I'm working my way with my Arabic uh, as much as I can. They can understand me. I can't understand them. They're speaking Jordanian. Everybody understands Egyptian. So same dilemma, same problem I've been having this entire trip. And, you know, they're going back to Amman. And I was like, well, hey, I could go to Amman. I was going to hitchhike there tomorrow. But, you know, is it OK if I come with you? And they're like, sure. So these guys end up, you know, picking me up. But I made a mistake, which is before getting in their car, you know, my shoes were completely soaked from um, Wadi Mujib because I went with my hiking boots. And um, I thought, well, OK, what's going to make them dry faster is putting them in the salt water. Right. So I dip my boots inside the salt water and I just imagine the salinity will help it dry faster. Um, fast forward a few hours, I get to Amman, I get to my hostel, I get this cheap hostel in the center, probably cost me a couple bucks, I think it was five or six bucks, um, very cheap, very empty, again, no tourism in Jordan, um, completely dead um, place, and I start putting these boots out, and, you know, the next day, I see that they're not anywhere close to being dry, they're not even drier, I put them outside hanging, and nothing was happening, um, upside down, outside hanging, Nothing was happening. And so I think I realized at some point that it was never going to dry. You know, this is this is what was starting to happen. I was, you know, a few days had been passing. I was spending time in Amman. I had a friend from Jordan that was living in Egypt. So I visited her, Julia. We had some beers. We went out. Hannah and Sammy, we went out. You know, we we had some fun. Even that was like the day that the vaccine passport was announced in Jordan. And obviously it didn't have a vaccine. So I was unable to even drink a beer. So we, we had this whole kind of situation. Can we get me into a place that's not looking for it? You know, we had all of these things to worry about. And at the same time, I'm stuck worrying about like, what am I going to do with these shoes back at the hostel? It's been like four days. You know, I was meeting up. We're going in a man. I mean, we're seeing these Roman ruins and all of these things. And I'm trying to live in the moment. And yet I'm thinking, oh, my God, in a few days I have a flight and I'm supposed to get on this flight and I have no idea what to do with these permanently wet shoes and so I start drying it I'm using like Kleenexes and all of these things and and these are the types of things that happen when you travel you know you have to make this mistake to to learn from your experience and I was really I mean I don't know the logic kind of seemed sound of yeah salty water is gonna get rid of it right if I put a bunch of salt on some sort of wet things I would assume that maybe it's not going to be wet anymore but apparently that's not the case so my my math or my my chemistry let's say was was completely flawed and um I was the one who was like kind of you know reaping the the not the rewards not the benefits I don't know I was suffering the consequences let's go with that um Anyways, I, I, I kind of start extending my stay. I hadn't booked a flight out yet. And I'm like worried about these shoes. And I kind of want to get to Ukraine. And then um, finally, I book a flight. I say, screw it. I'll figure out a, a way to get these, these shoes in a bag safely or whatever. And uh, then I end up going to this place called um, Jarash, which is very close to Amman. I think in about an hour away, about a dollar bus or something like that. Uh, no need to hitchhike or anything. And right there, you have these this perfectly like preserved, I mean, it's still a desert, right? Perfectly preserved Roman city with like the amphitheaters with, you know, you have these kind of different levels of like Greek and Roman architecture that are evolving through the ages and are not necessarily deteriorating. The only thing that's really breaking them are earthquakes because, well, the Dead Sea is kind of on this um, um, line, right? This uh, continental plate that you know separates and so you have earthquakes that really destroy things that's uh, why the dead sea is is below sea level and so you have this like perfectly preserved city save for a few earthquakes and then they have these cool things that you could do i mean you you have these columns that are permanently moving but you can't tell that they're moving unless you put this spoon in like between this little crevice and when you put it between the crevice, you see the spoon just moving ever so slightly up and down and up and down. And so these these little things that you you see, you know, like even when you're when you're inside these amphitheaters, um, some people don't know this, but these amphitheaters were made to you know make 
sound just be perfect. You could speak at this level, the level that I'm speaking, but you could be way further and you can hear me. So they have kind of like a, for lack of a better term, the G spot of this place where you could snap and it echoes where you're standing. It echoes, but for them, it's not echoing. So you have pretty cool music that people were performing in these old amphitheaters and their traditional things and um, bagpipes and everything. They ended up inviting me over. They gave me some food, some tea. And th these, you know, small acts of kindness really um, describe the Jordanian people. That's what I was feeling when I was hitchhiking. That's what I was feeling in Wadi Rum when they brought me to paintball for free. That's what I felt when I was given the ability to drive the car uh, from somebody who you know, picked me up as a hitchhiker. I mean, this is really the, the way that Jordanian people are showing, like, we care about you. And we're not just doing it because we would have something to gain. They had nothing to gain. And so they, you know, they given me food, chatting me up. They're, we ended up jamming a little bit together. I always had my kazoo in my pocket. I don't have it with me, but I was, you know, whipping it out and jamming with them. And it was, it was just so much fun. And from Jarash, I ended up finding, you know, this huge Hadrian's Gate. And for people who know, you know, Hadrian, he's pretty much been everywhere. He was one of those really tr well-traveled Roman emperors who created a wall in Britain. It's kind of determined, determined the, the line of where the Roman Empire ended on the northern part. But he also had a lot of things in different parts. And so in Jordan, um, he ended up creating this huge gate. I think it was the biggest gate that I've ever seen in my life. by uh called ajloon and then it's in a town maybe about 20 minutes away so naturally you know i kind of finish with the ruins real quick i have some food and i go to ajloon with my trusty thumb as a you know method of traveling and i get to ajloon and this was just really um like i was saying in the last episode where you start seeing the similarities of these mediterranean societies i mean this castle looked like something out of Portugal or Spain. It was, you know, made with like limestone and it was really, really nice, perfectly intact at the top of the hill with these towers and everything that you're looking at are these rolling hills of a little bit of like green. It was a little bit greener there and it's still kind of dry. So it was really like Southern Spain. And, and you know, I met this Portuguese couple there and they're like, it feels like home. And that was, you know, kind of those things that, that make you realize, like, you don't really need to go to all of these countries to and see all of these things. So this is kind of off the beaten path. And of course, it's spectacular. But, you know, some people say once you've seen one ruin, you've seen them all. Once you've seen one castle, you've seen them all. And I disagree with that, of course. But at the same time, you can see how much of these, you know, steal or share from each other. You know, even on that hitchhike, we passed by this massive castle and I was kind of like... I don't really want to stop there. That looks like an Aragonese castle. And I've seen a lot of Aragonese castles in southern Italy and Spain. So I didn't need to stop. I got to see it from afar. And castles usually look nicer from further away anyway. So don't take my word for it. If you want to go inside a castle, go inside a castle. But they do look a little bit nicer from further away. So, yeah, that was pretty much the end of my trip from Jordan. I ended up taking... Uh, just a bus back from Ajloon to Amman. And, and we, I think I partied one more time with one of my friends. Um, but essentially, like, you know, the, the biggest thing that I really got from Jordan was the hospitality of people, the, the, the kindness, the just the generosity of, of just being so selfless and giving everything to whoever it is. And, and this was kind of the story that other travelers have been were telling me. And I kind of expected it from Egyptian people and Egyptian culture. Maybe I was like, it's an Arab thing, but it doesn't seem to be, always be the case. And so, I mean, Jordan was just this eye-opening experience of like, wow, like, you know, sure, Wadi Ram and Petra are supposed to be the highlights, but Wadi Mujib was the highlight. But then even on my way to Wadi Mujib, I got floored by meeting this, this Palestinian man and just being able to finally like speak to somebody from that country and hear their experience for however short of a time we had, maybe an hour. Um, but, you know, that's that's why I do these things. That's why I hitchhike. That's why I put myself in that uncomfortable situation because some of the best lessons, some of the best experiences, and I say this in so many of my podcasts, cannot be planned. It cannot be just from, you know, having everything from A to Z planned. You need to just be able to go with the flow, see what happens. And those are the one, the, memories that you will never forget. So thank you for listening. 
And uh, I look forward to telling you guys more about my travels this year in the next few episodes. So take care. Toast out.